go ahead and get started and uh, hearty welcome to everybody and welcome to October. Uh, welcome to the Multiscale Recipes webinar. Lots of things to celebrate today. Uh, my name is Brian Rowe. I'm an applied economist in the Department of Agricultural, Environmental, and Development Economics at Ohio State University, along with Keo Kim, Kelly Babbitt, Slash Chavis, Ronnie Neff, uh, Swale Sadiq and Rachel Weiss, I serve as part of the Recipes Network Coordination Team. In a moment, we look forward to hearing from our distinguished panelists, who each represent key non-academic partners of the Recipes Network, and they'll provide us insights into emerging solutions for wasted food. Uh, if you go to the next slide, Rachel. Uh, these partners are essential in helping the Recipes Network adhere to its first guiding principle, which embraces the convergence principle of knowledge co-creation. That is, we believe in co-creating knowledge with our network members and partners, breaking down silos and transcending boundaries of disciplines and hierarchies. And each of these partner organizations provides critical knowledge and perspectives, which can help our network move towards convergence and achieve our goals of creating more sustainable, equitable and resilient regional food systems through circular approaches to addressing wasted food. Uh, today's a bit of a celebration as well. We're celebrating a one year anniversary of sorts for recipes. A year ago, we officially launched the network through grant funding uh, provided by the National Science Foundation's Sustainable Regional Systems Research Network Grant Program. The partners we hear from today, uh, they were each part of that original proposal that attracted the NSF funding, uh, but they're by no means uh, the only recipes partners. We encourage you to go to the uh, wastedfood.american.edu website to see our current list of partners and to reach out to us if you are interested in, in partnering. We are perpetually interested in partnering with organizations who share our passion and our goals to improve sustainability, equity, and resilience by addressing wasted food. Uh, next slide, Rachel. As we uh, prepare uh, for our panelists, uh, let's uh, make note of a few things. If you haven't done so already, please go ahead and mute your microphone. Um, I think we could double check here that we've also begun recording the webinar to share with others. So if you do have questions about whether the webinar will be available later, it will be. Uh, also a gentle reminder to panelists to pace your speaking so that those who are providing access through the CART translation services can keep up with the conversation. Uh, they're, they're very quick at what they do, but we will sometimes talk faster than even they can translate. Finally, please use the chat to pose questions or share comments. All right, um, if we go on to the next slide, I'd now like to turn over the program to Dr. Diana Burnley. Professor Burnley is not only an award-winning global cybersecurity expert with nearly 25 years of experience leading cross-sector teams to drive education, research and strategic innovation. She's also the vice provost for research and innovation at American University, uh, where she's also very busy as a faculty member in both uh, public administration and policy and in information technology and analytics. We are excited for her to bring her holistic viewpoint to strategic challenges to the topics our panelists will cover today. Take it away, Diana. Thank you, Brian, and welcome everyone to this webinar. I am so excited to be here with you this afternoon and to talk, uh, well, really to moderate the conversation around the emerging solutions for wasted food. I would be remiss if I didn't also wish you a happy Cybersecurity Awareness Month. Um, it is the month of October, and I hope that even as we begin the conversation around the solutions for wasted food, that we always have um, security and securing our systems at the top of mind. What I'd like to do first before we get into the Q&A is to give our panelists an opportunity to introduce themselves and perhaps tell us, tell us a little bit about uh, the solutions that they have been working on uh, and the organization that they represent. So why don't we go in the order that they appear on the slide and we will begin with Missy Hall. Thanks, Sienna. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Missy Hall. I'm a program manager and senior engineer with the New York State Pollution Prevention Institute. Um, we are located at the Rochester Institute of Technology and primarily work on grant funding through New York State's Environmental Protection Fund to help New York reduce its environmental footprint 
primarily through technical assistance with businesses and organizations, but also do work in outreach and education and grant programs. So um, one of our core programs is food waste diversion, um, which I manage. Um, and we do that with our, our technical assistance work where we're supporting businesses um, do a lot of well, we facilitate, do tech transfer, so we bring in solutions that have been validated and um, showcased by organizations like Refed on the ground, um, as well as actionable resources. Um, list shown here is an organic resource locator map, which shows a lot of the large sources of organics, as well as locations that collect that material and make new end products with it. Um, we have a community grants program, as well as a food waste uh, reduction and um, diversion reimbursement program. And we also do uh, research and development with our university partners in New York State to help implement or identify and implement uh, pollution prevention uh, solutions. So thanks. Thank you. And I don't see the opening slide anymore, but I believe Katie was next. So Katie, over to you. Thanks so much, Diana. Thank you, Brian, and the whole recipes team for hosting us today. It's a real pleasure to be here. I'm the operations director at Refed. We are a national nonprofit dedicated to advancing data-driven solutions to food waste. So we are kind of a, a perfect partner to be working with recipes, or, or rather, uh, we really find a lot of value in having a partner like recipes that even exists in the world. So really appreciative to this network. And we work across these three pillars that you can see on the slide here. The first one being data and insights. So as Missy referenced there, we provide a lot of the information for folks around the sector, whether that's food businesses, government agencies, other nonprofits, or even uh, other companies that are providing solutions with the data that they need to make informed decisions and really to take action. That's the most important part of that, taking action. We also do a lot in the capital and innovation space. So we raise funds for others and we, we distribute that through regranting initiatives. We advise private capital funds. And we also uh, really do a lot to elevate the solution providers across the space from an innovation perspective. We've hosted accelerator programs before. We have some funder networks and we're constantly looking for opportunities to provide both financial and non-financial supports to the networks that we work with. Um, for instance, during COVID, we did a series of learning sessions for restaurants and food service on how to reopen, how to reopen safely, things like that. And on stakeholder engagement, we really do a lot around bringing folks together we're really fortunate at Refed to have kind of this 30,000 foot view of everything that's going on. So we're really well positioned to say, hey, we know some folks over in you know, San Diego that are doing just what you wanna do uh, in Chicago. So why don't we put you all together so you're not recreating the wheel? And similarly, we can do a lot of matchmaking in financial spaces. We see people that have money that wanna give it to good causes. We know folks that need money. Uh, and we also host um, networks like our Food Waste Funder Circle, our Food Waste Action Network, which collectively have about a thousand members. And then some events like our annual Food Waste Solution Summit um, that brings together about 500 stakeholders across the sector to, um, I love the word that you used there, Brian, to, to celebrate what we're doing in the space, but also to move things forward. Um, it's been really nice to get back in person together after so many long months apart from one another. Um, and we do all of this not just to eliminate food waste, but really for those other impacts that it has on the climate, on our water systems, on society, on the economy. So that's what we're always looking towards is that bigger impact. Uh, thank you so much, Dan. Thank you. And Alex. Take yeah, us hi, on. everyone. My name is Alex Nicholas Van Wesa, and I'm the program manager on the Food Loss and Waste team here at World Wildlife Fund. And when we talk about food waste, I mean, we really see it at WWF as a potential for, um, you know, first of all, measuring and preventing food loss and waste, um, and then driving efficiencies across the global food supply chain for the benefit of people, companies, and the planet. And um, when we think about this, you know, we think this is a key lever really to close that projected food gap that we see to feed the world's population by 
by 2050 to, you know, to Katie's point, it's not just about food waste, it's about, you know, decreasing all of those conversion pressures and the resource pressures that are taking place to grow the food. And ultimately, as kind of true to the mission of a wildlife fund, it's about protecting biodiversity loss. Um, and, and so slowing those climate impacts of the food system and establishing more circular and sustainable food systems, true to uh, recipes mission as well. Um, and so uh, also to Katie's point, we really focused on, on action. So to help facilitate that, we're really trying to bring in more information and better measurement. Um, there are rough estimates of where it, of food loss and waste occurs, but this, this is not something that's built into the regular businesses operations today or business as usual. And so we're working a lot with governments, the private sector, to really accelerate um, measurement in particular, which is what we were brought in for um, in the school sector here for the recipes project. Um, and so what we do, as you can see on the screen, is we're trying to address these, these, efficient, these deficiencies today um, by developing and driving adoption of industry-specific toolkits, research, and measurement guidance. Um, and then we also through initiatives um, that we have, public-private initiatives on the West Coast of the US that we work on with ReFed as well. We're, we're trying to drive implementation or demonstration projects, um, and then ultimately take those learnings from the measurement and the, the demonstration projects to scale adoption across you know, company supply chains. And then WWF has a presence in over hundred countries. And so we're trying to you know, really spread that knowledge across our, our internal network as well. So you know, our, our vision is a world where all, edible food um, that's grown is eaten by people. And then any remaining nutrients are consumed by animals and then inedible organic matter is returned from the farm to create healthier soil. So simply put, food should be eaten by people and kept out of landfills. Um, and so um, I will say here in the US, we specifically work to apply kind of our theory of change to the sectors where we see um, you know, a, a large impact or a large potential to reduce food loss and waste. Um, per refed responsible for about 63% of the country's food loss and waste. So we focus in farms, grocery retail, um, hospitality and food service and schools. So um, that's it. That's enough for now, I'll say, but it's wonderful to be here. Thank you. And, and Alex, if we could, I'd like to stay with you because sure. I want to get a little bit deeper into some of the work that you've been doing uh, across all of you, as you talked about the different types of solutions and the different types of activities that your organizations were engaged in is really all about action. And even as we began the discussion in, and Brian mentioned the co-creation of knowledge, but it's not just for the, for the sake of the knowledge, right? It's so that we can put that knowledge into action. And so I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how the recipes network um, and, and, and the groups of, of different types of people and organizations that have come together have, um, accelerated your ability to put some of these solutions in action and perhaps give us a tangible example of some of the work that you've been doing. Yeah, happy to. Uh, it's been first and foremost, uh, really just insightful and invaluable to know what everyone else is working on. And so we work in the recipes project on reducing um, food waste in schools. So we've run a program called the Food Waste Warriors since about 2019 and really focused on K through 12 schools and reducing food loss and waste um, there as a part or as a manner of working with students to better understand the impacts of the food system and how that obviously has knock on effects with their favorite you know, animals and ecosystems. And so being a part of the recipes project, we've been immediately connected in with different, um, different researchers at, at universities. Um, and, and we've also been able to adopt and bring in some of what they're working on to share with our cohort of schools that right now have ongoing programs um, to try to implement some version of our food waste warrior program and are looking at what could be feasible for them. That could be as a tangible example, um, how to adopt and put into place share tables right now at a time when there is such high food insecurity, but there's such a emphasis on obviously food safety, um, in the pandemic, it made it so much more difficult to put in place a very common sense solution, such as a share table or a backpack program to take food that would otherwise not get eaten and, and, and provide it as a second meal to students that, that really depend on it and is a, is a lifeline for them. So that's a, that's a specific example. Another one I would say is the access to some of the ideas around policymaking. So um, with ReFed and with others, we work a lot on policy recommendations around food loss and waste, and it's been invaluable just to hear what the larger group and some of our different working groups have been pursuing as well so that we're not duplicating efforts and that's been um, invaluable for us as we as we ultimately meet with policymakers and develop some of our guidance 
Thank you. Kelly, what about you? Or excuse, excuse me, Katie. All right, my sister's name is Kelly, so I figured that one was for me anyways. Um, I, I mean, it, it's a lot of the same. It, it's been fantastic to have this incredible network of such a diverse set of skills and knowledge that we can tap into. So I, I mentioned that ReFed does a lot of work around the data and insights, and then I, I appreciated what Alex said also, that the data is, it's like, we're at level, I don't know, maybe we're making a D so far, we're not even making a passing grade, <laughs> in, in all honesty. Um, we'd, we'd love to get up to maybe a B plus, which might be realistic, um, but we're, we're not hitting the places where our data needs to be to let people make as informed of decisions as they're gonna be really confident making. And so we have a tool called the Insights Engine, or really a suite of tools on our website and they provide folks with access to understand the size of the problem, where food waste is occurring, why it's occurring, um, and then most importantly, jump into the solutions and get into some of the nitty gritty, like how much is this gonna cost? Who needs to take action on this? What type of policies need to be in place? Things like that. And so what's, what's really fantastic as we're planning to do annual updates to that data so that it isn't static and we see the latest greatest every year to know that we have this resource of economists, of behavioral sociologists, of um, you know, even computational um, mathematicians, like people that don't usually come together on a topic like this or might be hard to find, they, that might not be connected into a network like recipes previously, that resource is monumental. Um, so the work that the recipes team has done to bring this group together um, in an inter interdisciplinary fashion truly is phenomenal and having access to it is, is something that I, I hope we all um, can be able to benefit from. And then I think also opening up conversations really on the early stage, even around things like data ontology. I know the group has been running a couple of clusters or you know, mini networks to have these conversations around, again, some of the really tricky conversations that if we weren't together, we wouldn't be having, um, but that need to be hashed out so that we can advance the research further and go even farther than we would alone. Thank you. And I want to I want to come back to you. I'm going to go to Missy first, but I do want to come back to you because I want to pull on this data thread a little bit and talk a bit more about the sources of the data and perhaps some of the challenges. You know, it's it's a benefit to bring people together, but there's also challenges associated with trying to develop these ontologies and the the, the analytical techniques and such. And so I want to perhaps dive into that a little bit. So I'll give you a chance to think about that, um, and then we'll go to Missy, and then we'll come back. Sure. Um, I'm also very interested in the data, pe data piece. Um, and it's uh, starting with the data, I think it's really interesting to talk with different stakeholders too about what ways we're leveraging data and what level of specificity we need for those specific, you know, for those data elements of an individual business and their decision making versus a a county or a region or New York state and what they're thinking about as we advance our food system too. Um, but uh, going back to the original question and, and um, how I'm interacting with this group, um, I think there's more opportunities that I, I'm really excited to get involved with recipes, but um, you know, in a lot of ways, I see myself as a facilitator. I, you know, I sit at a university, but our group is very outward facing. And so we're trying to thread that needle between innovation and research and up and coming and the boots on the ground organizations that are implementing this work. And so recipes has been a, a really great opportunity for, for me to either connect individuals directly with the kinds of uh, work that recipes is putting out or you know bringing those folks to the table to have more conversations um, back into recipes about what's being seen you know within my connections in New York State. Um, 
So, you know, we're doing works with, work with communities and uh, helping them implement programs. And then at the same time, there's uh, webinars and publications out of this group looking at household level food waste. And so having those happen at the same time and having a great conduit for having that information flow, it's a really nice, easy way of, of closing the loop in a, a lot of ways that historically has been more challenging when you know, there's so many different resources out there and organizations working in this space, it's hard to keep up with it. Um, but I, I think recipes has really been a, a great thing for me as a tool uh, to help, you know, move the needle forward in New York State. That's great. So, so we're going to come back to you, um, Katie, on the data question. But before we do, I want to seed the next question, because it strikes me uh, at Missy, as you're talking about innovation and the thing that just keeps sticking in my mind is what Alex said about this challenge of, of food insecurity and the knowledge that we that food insecurity is so, so significant right now for our school-aged children, but yet some of the solutions that that would, I guess, traditionally be used, like the share table and such, is just not because we also have heightened awareness and concerns around food safety. And so I'm just thinking about, you know, a, a, a challenge like that and this notion of innovation and how recipes or the network of individuals coming together might help to um, innovate to address some of these um, some of these challenges that we're seeing given the, the state of the world. So we'll get to that. But first, let's go back to you, Katie, and let's talk a little bit about the data and the sources of the data and perhaps um, some of the challenges in um, bringing the group together and developing the ontologies and the other elements that you need in order to provide this real time and, and access to the data. Yeah, so we are Insights Engine, which like I said, it has a couple of different components to it. So for instance, we have a data model that's looking at the problem of food waste. And then within that model, there's different production level models. So we have one for farm, we have one, um, then we have a, we have one in there for grains, we have one for poultry. So there's all these different levels to the model as well. Um, across our insights engine, we're working with over 150 data sets. Now data set is a very loose term there. For some places that might mean, you know, some back of the envelope math uh, that got us to a couple of numbers. And that's the best that there is for some solutions or for some kind of corners of the insights engine or, or just the data in general on food waste. Um, for some places we're using really strong data. Uh, for instance, Nielsen donates um, point of sale data to refed. So we're actually able to use sales data and back into um, food waste data through sales data. Um, and then we also have some places on the solution side where we're getting data directly from solution providers. Some of those are folks that actually do waste tracking, for instance. We have like some waste haulers that donate data to us. There's a couple of places where I'd say we're getting some nice hard data, but then you also have to remember that usually that is, that might be data on tomatoes in Florida. And then we're having to extrapolate that to maybe tomatoes and peaches or some other proxy. So there's a lot of estimation going on. That's why I gave us a, a nice round D <laughs> across the board. So in some places it's a lot better. And, and we actually have a data quality score that we're very transparent about across our website. And in some places it's a one out of a five. And I think the highest score we might have today is a three. Um, so the, and some of that is the data simply isn't at a maturity state. In some places it's, a data transparency and confidentiality concern. So, so Dan, I'd love to have a, a conversation with you at some point. Um, I, I think you could be a real boon to this sector in that sense. Um, and, and I love the celebration that we have for this month. Um, in some places, it's there's still some shame around sharing data. Uh, people not wanting to share food waste data. There are also some states where um, Businesses, for instance, might not want to share data because they aren't allowed to be sending food to landfill or they aren't allowed to be sending a certain amount to landfill. And that has, unfortunately, a perverse incentive to then not report any data, lest that somehow get into the hands of someone that's going to penalize them for it. Um, 
And then in some places, it, just just to just to make sure I understand, and the shame is about we're sending so much to landfills, mm -hmm. and okay, yeah, and and what what I love to say to that is sharing that data is a great step forward. That's a fantastic first step to making progress because then you can actually. I think a lot of us are familiar with the phrase "you can't measure what or you can't manage what you don't measure." or you know, some iteration of that. And so sharing data or starting to collect data on your food waste is a really great first step. And we're all wasting food. I think it's 43% of food waste occurs at the consumer level. That's all of us on this panel in the room right now. Um, I am not perfect. I still waste food. I, I do my darndest, but it happens. Um, and and I, I think there's we've come a long way on the in the the category of shame and and having some more visibility in that space, but it's still there. Um, and then there's surely also sources that Refed doesn't know about, and I'm sure there's also people that for whatever reason they just don't want to share their data with us. Um, so there's there's a lot of places that the data comes from. There's a lot of places the data doesn't come from. Hopefully yet. And then there's places where the recipes team and, and many of the folks on the recipes network are being instrumental in filling gaps like seafood uh, or blue foods has been a real dearth of data. And I know Ronnie Neff and some others are actually working on different seafood projects right now. So there's some places where there are folks actively on the re recipes network that are filling existing data gaps. Um, and then on, on some of the challenges of, you know, there's this great resource and having everyone together, but when you bring more people together, ultimately there's gonna be differing opinions, especially when you get into something like ontology, you're going to have different perspectives and different experiences on what certain things mean, how data or words are going to be interpreted by different people. So there's always going to be a bit of a balancing act, which, can have negative outcomes. Um, sometimes compromises don't always get you to the best result. Um, yeah, I, I know that was a really long-winded response. So I'll, I'll pause there. No, that was that was great. And and I will say we have we actually have more reason to get in touch afterwards because similarly, when we're talking about cybersecurity incidents, right? One of the reasons why we have Awareness Month is because we want to say to people, it's okay to make a mistake but tell your security people that you've made the mistake. Don't be ashamed and not tell us because then we can't address the issue, right? And, and we it takes us longer. So that's there's definitely something in common. Um, and I, I wanna come to you, Alex, but Brian put a question in the chat and, and I think that it's it's a good time to ask this because it's it's about the shame notion and the fact that we are also pushing on ESG. And his question is, do the, do, does the, the emphasis on ESG um, exacerbate the shame issue or could it, or have you seen any examples of, of a linkage between those? Um, and I think that that's a, that's a really interesting point. I can jump in on this sure. and um, others please do so as well. But I, I think that with ESG, it's not so much that it exacerbates it. I, I happen to see that it actually brings some added attention or interest to it. And I'll give you an example. And so the first thing is the project that Katie and I are working on, on the Pacific Coast Food Waste Commitment, companies are often a little reluctant to Katie's point of wanting to come out and report that first because they don't want to have a black eye. And, and so one of the ways that, that you can get around that, right, is to say, well, even though you don't have a plan and you're not comfortable with how it might look this first go around, it's important to start reporting. You can do so by having your data aggregated in with the rest of the companies and having that anonymized to some degree. You still know what yours is individually, but what gets put out there, they're not going to come back and know that was your black eye. So it, it gets the ball moving. It gets that transparency we need to start finding in, in mobilizing solutions. But to Brian's specific question, as, as companies think about how to reduce uh, their upstream impacts, like when I talked about how we're always thinking about food waste is what all went into that food and, and, and how do we reduce that since it ultimately is driving all the biodiversity loss. It, it's thinking about, all right, well, measuring the loss, let's say, back through your value chain to, the, to let's say, the farm level, 
right? That is not only going to be about loss, that's going to be about helping you then calculate your emissions, your water usage, right? And, and obviously there's, there's so many other components to it, but I will say that as we think about ESG as a whole, there is a nice interlink there. Um, and I think it brings some added attention. So I haven't, there is always commitment fatigue and doing one of the more things. So it's just important to make sure it's complementary and it's interlocking in with those other ESG requirements. Interesting. And, and just as a follow-up, um, someone in the chat asked about the Pacific Food Waste Collaborative and has that helped to overcome some of the resistance, uh, retailer resistance into sharing data? Does, does anybody have a comment on that? Yeah, and I, I was just typing a response to that. I, oh. <laughs> uh, that might be Tom O'Donnell. So, hey, Tom, if that's you. Um, in short, yes, we've overcome a lot of resistance and it's taken time. It's taken us, I think the project really started about three years ago um, and we've come very far. We do have retailers reporting data to us for their second year now and we're getting, we're kind of back tracking a couple of years at once. Um, it's still very challenging and it takes a lot of time and labor. I'd say one of the biggest barriers is internal labor at a retailer or at a food business. Um, because nobody really has a food waste data person on staff. And so food waste is one of, you know, a dozen or 300 requests that the data person has in their queue. And food waste is not their priority for any number of reasons. So as we think about innovation, um, Missy, what kinds of solutions and how are you thinking about how um, being innovative in the context of the recipes network, in the context of this co-creation of knowledge is helping to advance or accelerate the development of some of the solutions? Um, that's a great question. Um, I, you know, even as recent as a few years ago, I don't know if I would have felt as excited about this network as I do today. Um, you know, a few years ago, a lot of the businesses we were working with were just, okay, now I got to start composting. You know, let's just put it in a different bin and I don't have to think about it. And so my connection in with this network was we're just not prepared to, you know, the people that I interact with aren't prepared for innovation. We don't need innovation. We're just trying to get people to compost. Um, I think, you know, one of the things I was thinking about and jotted down before our conversation today was I'm getting excited that from a household and community level, as well as a business level, I'm hearing and seeing more interested and in learning about waste reduction and different ways of either using innovation or just best practices to help reduce the waste at the source. Um, and I, I think that's what I'm cluing in on this organization is closing the loop with those conversations about what kinds of ways businesses and even community organizations and thinking about behavior change and how you interject um, those um, different interventions to motivate behavior change. Um, that's where I'm seeing as a great opportunity to connect in with this group. Um, I think there's a lot of great research going on that I hear from, from this recipes team, thinking about what those interventions may be, especially in um, you know, underserved communities um, and how I can then be a, a supporter for bringing that information into the communities that I work with, as well as businesses, of course. Um, so, you know, we see new companies um, developing technology to help with the donation chain, um, you know, getting into farms, recovering that food, uh, thinking about solutions that don't require a lot of space in restaurant kitchens, um, different ways of, again, food measurements of having arming our businesses with information that allows them to make better decisions that saves them money and reduces food waste. Um, so, I think I'm answering your question, but uh, yeah. again, we're 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 advancing further from where I'm sitting to to the point where I think there's a great opportunity to connect on the ground with research to you know organizations like Refed and World Wildlife Fund to come up with solutions that are implementable. 
That's great. And, it, you know, I love this discussion because you all you play off of each other, but there's so many new questions that come up. And one of them, as you were talking and, and talking about challenges, at least the challenges of five years ago and how that flows into today, I started thinking about this notion of food insecurity and food waste and the challenge of communication and contextualizing and making it real for people who don't live this every day. And I can imagine, and again, Cybersecurity Awareness Month, you have to forgive me, but that's all that's in my brain. But, but part of our challenge is trying to get people to understand what we're talking about and the, the, conser the, the importance of it. And so Alex, when I hear you talking about food insecurity of children in school, that immediately gets me. When I hear you talking about food waste, it doesn't grab me in the same way. It, it, it almost seems a bit separated from, um, it, it, it just seems, just seems a, a little bit more esoteric perhaps, or just it, it's, it's harder to, to put yourself into that really empathetic mode of, I want to act, I want to do something. And so I, I wonder as you are working in the recipes network and, and just in, the, in your organizations in general, as you're thinking about the challenge of translating the, the problem of communicating with folks, how are you, how are you going about that? What, what have you found that works or doesn't work? And um, are there particular things that you can share with us? And, and Alex, we'll start with you. And, and certainly if the others want to weigh in, that would be great. Great question. And I couldn't agree more. I mean, I think it's very simple, but I think it's, it's just about kind of code switching and catering to your specific audience. And so when we found is we're sort of coming back to normal, right? No one's going to call this normal, but as we're coming back to people being in school and operations getting back to what they were. I do think that right now, instead of coming in and saying, we need to do something about food waste, which to your point, not everyone who's not well-versed in this is going to immediately want to jump on and saying, look, there, we know how food security is increasing at the moment. We know that there's surplus food that otherwise is going to go uneaten. Let's make sure that that food gets to those kids who want it and who need it. And if you frame it in that way, what we've been told by our cohort that we're that we're working with schools is, is that that has been a galvanizer and, and a way to really get a foot in the door to talk about it. So they don't, it's, it's a way to make sure that food loss and waste is addressed, that it is an issue. Um, but it, it, if it's, it, if it's talked about in a way and it's, and it's through one of the interventions that really does aim to address um, food insecurity, that's, that's been what I've in, in our, you know, kind of this, this past year, which has been such a difficult time to work on anything in schools, let alone something that isn't, just about the essentials of educating kids. And so that has been one way that we've we've started to see some traction. So I'll pause there and defer to the rest of the panelists. Katie? Yeah, you know, there's also some really interesting work that I think we can learn from in the climate change space around evidence-based um, communication behaviors and evidence-based behavior change work. And, and I think a great example of this is um, cold washing your clothes. It's a strategy that had been championed by you know climate change communities. And the reason that it's been effective in a behavior change method is because of the simplicity, that it's just a button you have to push on your washing machine. Now, reducing food waste in some places is that simple. And in some places it's very much not. And so I, I think one of the ways we can better work on this together is also thinking about our end users and, and kind of thinking about them like that. Um, thinking about, you know, how are we making this easier for consumers to waste less, not just expecting them to take on all of the burden of reducing that waste or, or getting it to donations or getting it to composting or some other valuable in life. So I, I think that's some really interesting work that we can draw from and also really builds upon some of the, the psychology, the sociology and different experiences that the recipe networks has in its, um, in its toolkit. Missy, what about you? I just wanted to, I was nodding along with Katie um, with that statement too, is not every organization or business or individual that we interact with is going to be motivated by the environmental impacts 
Um, some for some folks that may be the the community elements and and what what businesses can do to help those around them. Um, some of it is the economics, and so um, as we're helping organizations implement solutions, it's really you know what is going to motivate them to take that action, and and what kinds of things are they able to implement? I mean, not everybody's able to start with you know, let's donate more food or, hey, let's start composting tomorrow. It's really an understanding of what kinds of barriers are in their way of taking the next step and, and what kinds of things are going to help them, you know, champion the issue in the way that they see it rather than in the way I see it too. You know, I'm struck by, uh, Katie, I'm, I'm struck by the the grade that you, you, you gave. Um, on the data piece on D, that's that's not very good, um, but the, this just means there's room for improvement. And uh, and and I'm wondering, as we think about the network and we think about the work and the the pacing of the work, what do you think is a realistic goal for the year ahead um, in in that sort of space, and how do we get there? a big question. Um, I mean, there, I could probably pick a, a dozen different directions that we could go. Um, and I'll, I'll probably, um, hopefully the, the team will reel me in afterwards, but I would love to see us get some stronger data on the causes of food waste. That's one of the areas where we have, you know, some pretty weak data. And this is like, did food waste go to, did it go to waste because it was not harvested, it was excess, it spoiled, it was date labels. You know, we only have about 10 or 12 categories. There's, you know, you can get into third and fourth level causes in that. You know, I'm only talking about the surface level, but it's those causes that really help us line up what solutions are going to be relevant. Because if something went to waste because it was not harvested, that's a different on-farm solution that needs to be implemented versus did something spoil because you know us consumers left us in the fridge too long. That's a very different solution and type of intervention. So I, I'd like to see some stronger data on causes. There's a lot of places we could start with that. That could be a really big project. It could be right-sized. Um, but I'll leave it there. I do see Brian coming back on. So as I as I sign off, and I know that Brian is coming back on, and I apologize that I have to sign off a few minutes early, but um, I just want to thank you. I learned a lot uh, in this brief time with you, and I hope that we will follow up. I do do believe that there's lots of overlap that we can learn from each other, and and I will pitch to my recipes colleagues that we need to get the cybersecurity people involved. Um, because there is so much that we can do together, not just from a lessons learned, but I, I suspect that um, because many of the systems um, that you use, and I use the word big word systems, um, are actually electronic systems, there are security concerns that need to be um, need to be addressed. So I thank you as I sign off. And Brian, I don't see Brian back on, but I presume um, he oh, I'm here you are. <laughs> Okay, perfect. <laughs> All right. Have a wonderful rest of the seminar, everyone. Thank you, Diana. <clears throat> Thank you for your, uh, yeah, it's great to have a cybersecurity network uh, expert here to talk us through some of the um, convergent issues that we can learn from other uh, areas of research. <clears throat> and speaking of research, we've heard a little bit about some pressing research needs, um, both from the chat and from some of you. Um, but it would be interesting to think about <clears throat> the rest of these network that is part of our strength is uh, deep resources in research capabilities to think about what, um, as you think about the solutions that really are exciting you or motivating your um, actions, what, what research um, is most needed for you to help really narrow in on that? Katie, we heard a bit about um, yours for understanding the, the, the motivation for waste at each step. Um, but maybe others can chime in, and Katie, you probably have others as well. So why don't we go to uh, Missy and then uh, Alex and ask about your thoughts on that. Just looking at my notes to see what kinds of things we haven't talked about yet. 
Um, so the causes for food waste, I think is huge. Um, as Katie mentioned, um, a, another one of interest is, you know, thinking about food waste less as a, uh, a whole and more like how interventions or how solutions change depending on the food waste type or where it's coming from. Um, so, you know, food manufacturing versus our restaurants and, and what kinds of things they're serving. We haven't talked about it today, but a huge area is, you know, thinking about contamination, um, which is being addressed at the recycling facility end as a huge cost, but as well as, you know, the front end and, and thinking about um, different mechanisms that are available to help reduce that contamination across the supply chain. Um, and uh, a big and huge area of me for me and and what I think about a lot is the the behavioral aspect of of what kinds of mechanisms are needed to support I'm going to say businesses but everybody implement these solutions so uh, what kinds of tools should I be armed with to help address this change at individual locations so I'm you know, we try to do that on a business by business case, but what kinds of overall themes can we translate um, on the behavior change aspect uh, that's being seen in research as you guys are looking at this at a, a larger level? Great, thanks. Alex, what are your thoughts on this? Um, so I, I'm at a team retreat this week and have been talking with our sustainable protein team in particular. And one of the areas that we're really interested in is, you know, just how do we accelerate uh, or, or develop policy support or roadmaps to um, really build out the momentum that we're starting to see on, on the, the waste to animal feed front. Um, and so, it, it, you know, really identifying those, those new feed additives to displace and reduce the impacts of those more traditional um, resources, such as soy and corn, which are having such a disproportionate um, impact on conversion and um, ecosystem loss. And so um, we want to try to, in general, start to further investigate, map out um, where you can get away from, you know, surplus just being seen as the cost of doing business and more as a potential asset. I think everyone here knows of those the, the examples like too good to go or upcycled foods or do good foods, kips or farms, things that are already trying to take surplus. Um, there's the California dairy companies that I know have taken, I think up to 30% of their feed and they've used waste to feed to replace things like water intensive alfalfa um, with, with different byproducts. And so I think as more companies start to measure food loss and waste up their supply chains, hopefully that starts to set the stage for where some of this byproduct or cost of doing business could be better utilized, but I know we need more research for it. So, I mean, we're, we're looking at, and what I would ask everyone here is just identifying and quantifying high potential surplus or byproduct waste streams that would be difficult to feed back in the human food stream, obviously, um, and that would be good for animal feed. So um, these need to be widely available. Um, they would need to be consistent and appropriate nutritional makeup to be used in you know, livestock feed after processing, drying, stabilizing, obviously worrying about contamination. That was a great point. Um, and so some ideas that we've just been kicking around are, you know, convenience store chain waste or post-consumer waste, um, fish oil from, from fish byproducts, not from whole fish. Um, there's some great research on a recent article in Nature about this. Uh, there's a lot of potential here in the U.S. for cereal processing byproduct, um, sugar beet, citrus pulp, oil seed oils. So um, those are just some of the things that... Um, is a, is a research question that you were very at the beginning stage of, but would love to, to partner with everyone on further investigating. Hey Alex, just before we go to Katie, just, um, and maybe Katie will have some insights on this as well. We did talk about ESG policies and standards for um, attracting more. Uh, do we think or know, uh, maybe you guys know, our food waste uh, uh, reduction um, policies or procedures at uh, firms being uh, rewarded and recognized within those standards, or is that an area that still needs to be built out in order for that to um, be wrapped into that rubric? Maybe Missy, you might know as well. I don't have a great answer for this one. Alex, I don't know, or Katie, do you guys know if, that, if any food waste stuff is getting built into ESG standards or not? 
Not that I'm aware of. I, Alex, unless I'm incorrect here, I believe it's still a gap. Um, but there has also been some work um, on, oh, my acronyms are eluding me, but there, there's been some other standards in the financial investment space reporting in addition to ESG, mm -hmm. um, looking at food waste too. So I, it's, it's starting to get some ground in that realm of the world, but it still has a way to go. So I'm hearing that a potential research need that could be a lever would be to perhaps partnering with um, uh, those in the financial community to try to build out and flesh out that connection between uh, food waste reduction tendencies and uh, getting rewarded in those spaces. Yeah, absolutely. That would be fantastic. And a great example of someone who's done that is um, Sodexo. They actually built food waste KPIs into their revolving credit loan that they took out uh, last year or the year before, or might have even been pre-COVID. Uh, time is also eluding me and life in general, but um, there are some examples where that has been done on a really big scale. That's impressive. Um, um, <clears throat> trying to scan the um, here for other questions. Um, one thing we talked about um, um, in terms of innovations, and there's been some policy movements, particularly at the state level, um, various carrots and sticks on the food waste front. Um, any of these exciting you? Any of these uh, do you think um, uh, really warrant more research to understand <clears throat> whether the carrot or stick or some other approach might be most effective at um, stimulating change? Go ahead, Missy. Uh, um, I, you know, it, it's nice that Massachusetts has had a food waste ban for a few years. So they have, you know, several years worth of data and have you know put out uh, reports over the years on on the impacts of of their ban for large generators. I'm also interested to see, you know, from a statewide perspective, you know, Oregon, unless I'm mistaken, is taking the route of going food waste prevention focus rather than thinking about landfill bans. Um, so I think over the next couple of years, it will be really interesting to see how industries progress and what the focus is and the data based on you know, their methodology to go after waste reduction um, as their focus compared to some of the states, including New York, that is, uh, has a new food waste law. Mm -hmm. Do we think um, <clears throat> research is in, in lined up to be able to evaluate, for example, the new New York um, policy so that we have a good idea of what's working and what's not? Um, I'd like to think so. Um, you know, um, there are annual reports for the businesses that are required to comply. Um, there's, you know, businesses collecting that food waste and, and donation. And so, um, again, we're still learning about how good that data is going to be. But um, you have a, a large population of businesses now in New York State that are required to to donate and uh, recycle their food scraps. Um, so there should be more to come in New York, but we are a little bit, uh, there are, again, other states that are a little bit further ahead on that front. If I can just build on that really quick, Brian, I, I would say anecdotally, this is maybe to the point that we do need a little bit more research, but I think that the the carrot versus the stick, when it comes to smaller or medium sized businesses, take restaurants, for example, that are just trying to get by at the moment. It's it's really hard to, in our experience with the PCFWC, through other efforts to find incentives or carrots right now. Um, just like when we talked about schools, it, it, sometimes I think that for that uh, part of the um, of the economy, it's important to have these laws. And there's many different variations to Missy's point. Doesn't it can be a man food organic waste recycling mandate, it can be a landfill ban, there's, you know, any number of ways to do this. And I think that we've seen enough evidence that that is really what's going to be the driver to think about businesses of all size really having to confront the problem um, versus just kind of dangling different carrots and hoping that it will. So I would say that's my, my, my understanding from a policy perspective, but then just having worked with some of the businesses too, and hearing what really got them to take action. So 
<clears throat> I've got one more question. I think we've got time for this to take it in a slightly different direction from Callie. She asks, um, she'd love to hear what the panel might share specifically with students in the audience. How can students effectively prepare for joining the workforce and tackling wasted food challenges? Good one to end on. So I, I actually was fortunate enough to be on a, a panel last Thursday uh, with universities fighting world hunger and uh, was was totally geared towards students. Um, but it, I would say pick something that you have an interest in and you know take a step and then take another step. And you don't have to start huge. Um, none of us, none of these organizations started at the size that they're at today. Re, you know, I'm actually Refed's oldest employee. And when I started, we were three people. We're only like 20 today. Um, but you can start small. Uh, one of my other favorite examples is the FarmLink project that was started by students um, in university. They've now rescued about 86 or 90 million tons of food from farms and redistributed it across the country. They started with a U-Haul truck that they pinned a FarmLink banner onto. And then they did two U-Haul trucks. And then they actually started getting funding and being able to get some real truck rentals. Um, but the point of all that is, Start small, find something that you're passionate about. There's so much you can do in the space, whether it's data or behavior change, like we've been talking about. You can work on it from a climate angle, from an economist angle, like Brian does. There's literally like you can you can dig through garbage cans. I've done that. Um, you don't have to eat it. Um, there's so much fun you can have. <laughs> Missy, do you want to share something too? Sure. Yeah. Um, I. I think students especially are in a great space to just ask questions um, and, and question that status quo um, of, you know, why are we throwing that away or why isn't there an opportunity to take this action or um, really just upset the norm? Um, I mean, anyone can do that anytime, but, you know, students, you're coming in with a unique perspective and hopefully a lot of energy. And so, um, be, being able to ask those questions, uh, work with a professor, you know, we see a lot of new technologies that are coming out of student groups, which is so cool to see. Um, but yeah, keep asking questions and, and, and provoke change. Um, we are pretty much at time. So we're at 359. I do want to get a blurb in. Next webinar will be Thursday, November 17th at 2 p.m. We will reach out and let people know more about the content for that. Please sign up for the recipes email list there that was put into the chat so kindly by Rachel. Um, Rachel, anything else? Uh, I think um, I think I'd just like to thank our panelists for their great insights. Thank Diana for her time moderating the panel and thank everybody for uh, participating today. I think we I learned a lot as I normally do when <clears throat> talking to smart people like those on the screen and really enjoyed the perspectives they bring. And we look forward to working more with them as recipes moves forward towards our goals to uh, have convergent ideas to solve the wasted food problem and make our food systems more sustainable. So thanks all. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks, everyone.